grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for our message this morning is our gospel lesson uh, from Luke chapter 12. Uh, and I should point out that you should have received a sermon outline this morning uh, along with your bulletin, so you are welcome to follow along with that. Uh, or fill in blanks uh, as you. I know it's always so satisfying to fill in blanks. So if you uh, would like to follow along with that, you are welcome to. Uh, but our lesson again is from Luke chapter 12, uh, where we hear again these words of Jesus uh, from verse 51. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. And this is the word of the Lord. Uh, dear friends in Christ, uh, I don't know about you, but when I think about Jesus, uh, there are certain words and certain Bible verses uh, that readily come to mind. Uh, first off, I think of Jesus as loving. Loving. Uh, and that classic verse of God's love for the whole world, uh, for Jesus uh, in John 3.16, For God so loved the world uh, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, I think of Jesus as someone uh, who is a caretaker uh, in times of distress or in times of trouble. Uh, when he says in Matthew 11, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I think of Jesus as loving, I think of Jesus as a caretaker, and I think of Jesus as someone who gives life. Uh, as he went and he talked uh, to Martha after her brother Lazarus had died, she knew that, that she would see Lazarus again on the last day, but Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Jesus is loving. Jesus takes care of me in times of trouble. Jesus is one who gives life. He will raise me from death as well as all believers in him. These are verses that I often think of uh, when I think of Jesus and his work for us. Uh, these are verses that honestly, uh, they make me feel good. Uh, and they probably make you feel good too uh, because they speak important truths to us about who Jesus is and what he has come to do for you and me. Yes, we think of these kinds of verses often, but it's in light of these kinds of verses that we have our verses from Jesus today. Uh, verses that we don't often uh, think about uh, as much, uh, because there are certain things uh, in our Christian life uh, that Jesus says that are such a comfort uh, to us in our Christian faith. But then there are things like today, uh, words in which he speaks to us that maybe make us feel a little uh, uneasy. Uh, things that challenge us as we think about our Christian faith and also our lives in the world. That's what we have a little bit more of today. You heard what Jesus said, I have come not to bring peace, but division. Uh, now let's make sure that we understand what's going on here. Jesus says he has come not to bring peace, uh, but division. Uh, now again, if that doesn't sound uh, disturbing to you based on what we've kind of talked about with, with Jesus uh, in your life of faith, I'm not really sure what does. Uh, because when he was prophesied about in the Old Testament, uh, in Isaiah 9 and verse 6, uh, we are told these words that we often say during Advent and Christmas time. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, and his name shall be called what? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And in the New Testament, in Romans 5, 1, Paul says, Therefore we have been justified by faith. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus himself says uh, in John 14, 27 to the disciples, he says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Scripture, friends, is abundantly clear. I mean, Jesus does bring peace. So I see you back there, Rick. You're wondering, why does he say otherwise then? Well, we're going to try to get to that this morning a little bit further. Uh, but I think to answer uh, that, we need to think a little more about what we mean uh, when we say peace. Uh, because Jesus does bring peace, but he brings it in a way that's a little bit different uh, than how maybe we would define it or how we uh, would expect. 
Uh, you see, when we think of peace, uh, we often think of several things. Uh, when we think of peace, we think, one, uh, peace is an absence of conflict. There isn't fighting going on, there isn't quarreling going on, people are generally getting along. Uh, there's not a shouting match or an ongoing feud uh, in the office. Uh, peace means absence of conflict. Uh, we may think of peace uh, as removing ourselves uh, to a state of calm. Uh, you can picture it. It's been a long, uh, hard day, but the day is nearly done. Uh, and now you're sitting at home in your recliner uh, with your favorite show on TV. The kids are in bed. The dishes are done. Peace. Just being able to relax a little bit. Uh, now, finally, number three builds off of number one a little bit, but we think of peace as just kind of a general unity among us and others. I often think of a basketball game and a coach explaining the play on the sideline. Uh, and then when the players get out there, there isn't a whole bunch of confusion and people going to the wrong places, but rather you see it executed to perfection. Everybody goes to the right places, the play runs just as designed, and the basket is scored. Uh, there's no conflict, it's a relaxing home, and there's unity. Uh, these are the types of things uh, that we think of when we think <coughs> of peace. And sometimes this word of peace uh, is real. Uh, there really isn't any conflict. Uh, you really are in a state of calm, and there really is a general sense of unity uh, among people uh, in this life. But other times, it's a bit of a false peace, isn't it? Uh, you don't see conflict going on, uh, but maybe you have some friends or coworkers who aren't really sure how to approach you to talk about something that's frustrating them. About you. Uh, maybe uh, you go to sit in the recliner and turn on the TV, but you've been ignoring a bunch of family problems that just seem to be getting bigger and bigger. Uh, the employees, uh, they put on a positive face uh, and are joking around and chit-chatting it up with the boss when he comes in, only when he leaves to grumble and gossip about what's going on. Uh, while our peace uh, is sometimes real, all too often it is a figment of our imagination. And when it is a figment of our imagination, it is a false peace. And false peace is nothing short of division. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it's this false peace that Jesus doesn't bring. In fact, the peace that he brings has to cause division. Uh, and why? Uh, well, first, you and I, we have to look at ourselves uh, in the mirror. Uh, because of you, because of me, instead of peace with God, we first sought division. Uh, because we didn't want to go God's direction. We didn't want to obey his commands for our lives, and we didn't want to walk in unity with him. We didn't. Uh, and how could we? Uh, we were born with this condition, Paul talks in Romans and in Colossians, how for sinners, enemies of God who were alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. It's all division. It's the vision between me and God. It's the vision between me and others. It's the vision even between me and myself. Uh, as Paul talks about what a wretched man he sees himself doing the things uh, that he doesn't want to do and not doing the things he does want to do. It's all the vision going on with us every single day. Uh, that's like what it's like on our own in our sinful nature. Now we're here this morning, uh, and we know, of course, uh, that Jesus... Uh, has given us peace. We have peace with God, uh, and he's brought us here uh, to be with him. Uh, he's brought us here, and he came, and he lived the perfect life that we, he never, that we never could. He died a death on the cross to pay for all the sins that we never could, and he was resurrected from the dead for our forgiveness and for our life, something that each of us could never do on our own. And so Paul's words from Ephesians are so fitting uh, for this morning. Paul writes, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of two, so making peace and killing the hostility. We have peace with God. We have no more dividing wall of hostility. That sounds good uh, to me, like a great message, and it is a great message. Uh, and it's one that we share with others because we know the peace that Jesus brings. But of course, as we're here this morning, we know that some don't want peace, do they? Uh, you'll get this sense a lot. People will be fine about, you know, kind of generally talking about God being loving. They like that idea. 
Uh, people will be generally fine with the idea of talking about how we're supposed to love other people. Uh, they like that idea too. But when you start bringing up Jesus, what he did, the subject can quickly change. And this is why. I mean, people don't like being told, as Isaiah says, that their righteous acts are just like filthy rags. Uh, people don't like being told that they are on their own dead in their sins. And people don't like being told, as Jesus said, that he is the only way. He's the only way, the truth, and the life. And that no one comes to the Father except through him. And because of this, not everybody believes this central teaching. We have these households are divided. What Jesus is talking about in Luke chapter 12 uh, sons against fathers, mothers against daughters, and so on. Neighbors, co-workers, you get the picture. Jesus says he comes not to bring peace, but division. And right before that, he says, I came to cast fire on the earth, and would it not have already been kindled? It's as if Jesus is saying, he just wishes that we could get ahead and get judgment over him. Just because it's so dreadful to contemplate. He knows what he's going to accomplish. He knows that he will make a way between God and mankind so that there is peace in his cross. But still, not everyone is going to believe in him. Now, it's not just uh, the idea of earning salvation uh, for us through the cross and empty tomb that Jesus has that causes division. It's also other Jews as well. Uh, earlier this week, I saw a friend of mine post on Facebook, and maybe you saw this post as well. Uh, from a Catholic archbishop the other day, and he shared a troubling post. Uh, the post was from Robert Barron, the auxiliary bishop of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. And this video, uh, in it, he reflects on a recent Pew uh, study uh, that found this troubling fact among United States Catholics. Among United States Catholics, 69% don't believe that Jesus' body and blood are present in the Lord's Supper and Holy Communion. Less than one-third of, of practicing Catholics, of, of U.S. Catholics, I should say, believe that Jesus' body and blood are truly present in the Lord's Supper. Now, if you don't know anything about Catholicism, this is a central teaching of the Catholic faith, uh, that Jesus truly is present with his body and blood in the Lord's Supper. And that's something you know, that we share as Lutherans. We have some differences in our understanding of communion uh, with the Catholics, uh, but that is a central teaching uh, among Catholics and Lutherans and some other um, denominations as well, that Jesus truly is present with his body and blood in the Lord's Supper. Um, now, why is this, uh, the, the bishop explains a little bit further, why is this that we have so many people who don't uh, believe the central teaching of the church? Uh, well, he talks about over the last several decades, uh, there's been this division within the church uh, that tries to divide reaching out in love and caring for other people on one hand with doctrinal unity on another hand. Uh, it's a division between caring for the community and caring about what Holy Communion and what baptism is or what the Bible is. In other words, uh, it's the thinking uh, that the church is primarily about being a nice group of people. It's primarily about being inclusive and welcoming. And we don't really need to worry about the teaching stuff or the doctrine stuff. That's not really that important. Now friends, I don't share all this this morning uh, to bash our Catholic friends, as I know we have a, a lot of them here uh, in this community, but I say this because this is really important. Uh, I say this because if we just come here and we say, you know, the Nicene Creed that we confess this morning, it's not really all that important. Uh, baptism, not really all that important, it's just a symbol. Communion up here, just kind of a symbol. God's Word that we read, well, maybe it's God's Word, maybe it's not. If we start saying all those things, then there is absolutely no point for us to come here this morning. There's no point for us to come here. But friends, if this is what we start believing, uh, you know, if we start believing all of these different things, we just simply pray, as we saw uh, in the Lord, yeah, just right before our sermon, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Curb those who by the seed or sword would wrest the kingdom from your son and bring to naught all that he has done. Friends, it's, it is in light of this division from God, division between unbelievers and God, division that the devil sows in the church, uh, getting its members to reject central teachings, that Jesus says in our reading, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. When he says this, he's speaking of his death. 
He's distressed thinking about it then. He's distressed when he's in the garden uh, in agony, and he's distressed when he is on the cross. But friends, he said, until it is accomplished, and it is now accomplished. It is finished, he said, as he bowed his head on the cross. And what did he say to his disciples when he appeared? He said, peace be with you. Your sins have been paid for, dear friends, it is finished and you have peace. In baptism, you really are connected to Jesus Christ. It is finished and you have peace. When we hear God's word of forgiveness for us, both from myself and from these words that we have printed before us every week, it is finished and you have peace. When we receive the Lord's body and blood, his real present body and blood for us, for our forgiveness, it is finished and you have peace. And when we go to be with the saints in glory forever, it is finished and you have peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard and keep your hearts and lives in this Christ Jesus to life eternal. Amen. Get our children forward for a children's message and object lesson.